to chapter 4 of 532. We're going to do a little bit of cloud computing discussion around infrastructure as a service. So today we're going to be looking at defining and describing infrastructure as a service and identify some solution providers. It'll be kind of just interspersed throughout this. We're going to define and describe co-location because it's really kind of neat. Define and describe system and storage redundancy. Define and describe cloud-based network attached storage devices and identity and identify solution providers. And then we're going to define and describe load balancing, identity, and cloud-based solution providers, and then some pros and cons around IaaS. So one of the big things to remember about this is that this is really more like what you're going to understand in your own data center today. So and an IaaS provider makes all of the computing hardware resources available, and the customers in turn are responsible for installing and managing the systems, which they normally do for the most part today in their own data center. So you get from the virtualization layer on up, the provider takes from the virtualization layer on down. So they'll take power, they'll take fire, they'll take um, hardware provisioning, they'll take clustering and all the other things. You just have to worry about your operating system on up. But you also have to deal with some other things that go along with this. So you still have to deal with security, you still have to deal with compliance, regulation, governance, all the other things that you have to do in your own data center. You will share that with your IAS provider. So. Right now, today, what a data center must provide for this basically is just this, the everything from the virtualization layer on down for an IAS process, right? You want high-speed redundant internet service, you want air conditioning and to get rid of the heat generated by the servers. You wanna have condition power, UPS systems, generators, all the other things in case power dies out, fire suppression systems, racks, um, computer decking, all those things, and administration staffing to support the hardware, the networks, and, and the operating system. And that operating system is the virtualization layer on down for IAS. Big thing to remember on that one. Bottom line is data centers are expensive. It doesn't matter who owns them, who's running them, and who's maintaining them. They are expensive. And sometimes that is a little bit too expensive, especially if you're a smaller company or a startup company. You may not think you can afford it, and the cloud gives you that opportunity to actually start building in some kind of redundant um, processes into your small company processes for data. So a co-located data center is actually really kind of interesting. And here in the Seattle area, we actually have a couple of them that are run by level three, and they are really neat. And they're basically used to reduce the risk of single point of failure. And basically what we're doing is we're creating a duplicate data center at a remote location. Should one of the data centers fail, the other can immediately take over operations. Unfortunately, it does increase costs, but there's some interesting things you can do. Now, this all assumes that you own all the things in that co-location space. So you, all you're doing basically is running a rack from them. You're providing the hardware, you're providing the software, um, the disks, and everything else. The only thing the co-location center provides you is a rack in a server room and security and network and cooling and fire suppression and all the other things. So if they do this and you just buy the rack and you fill it with your stuff, you can actually go, you know, buy your rack at level three downtown Seattle, buy your rack at level three out in Redmond and use that in conjunction with your data center to kind of have a three-way data center that you can actually move and load balance in between if you want to do it that way. So lots of interesting ways of working with that but you do have to remember that you have a data centers that you now need to work together with and you have to increase your management, you have to increase your, your um, licensing, you have to increase your time, you have to increase the amount of time it's going to take you to patch everything. There's a lot of things that go into that co-located data center. So the good part about what a co-location data center can do is it makes you less susceptible to fire, acts of God, terrorism and other things. Um, and that's really true here. So I live in the Seattle area. And we have a trifecta. We have tsunamis, we have a volcano, and we have earthquakes. So earth, air, water. Basically, we got it all. So if the volcano goes, then we'll need to move our data center, or we'll need to be able to move our operations off to someplace else. So for Seattle, the two failover places are Ashland, Oregon, and Spokane. So I'll have a data center in Ashland, Oregon, or I'll have a data center in Spokane or both, and then I'll have my normal operations here in Seattle if I own all my own data centers and I don't immediately leverage the cloud, right? Now, the good part, though, is I can actually distribute my workload now. 
I have three data centers. I might as well have them do a thing. I might as well have them working and at least mirroring each other so they can just immediately take over should something go out, which is good. We want that. So you can get a distributed workload. You can do neat things. You can probably service more people along the way. You may not need to provision more hardware because then you can move any kind of peak, peak usage over to a, a data center that's not as busy. It makes the company less susceptible to downtime due to power loss from a blackout or brownout or if the volcano goes or the tsunami comes or the earthquake comes. But the thing we don't provision for are people. So how do I move all of my administration staff from Seattle after an earthquake where the roads aren't going to be too good to get them to Ashland, Oregon or Spokane? So I also have to have at least a skeleton crew in Ashland, Oregon and Spokane if I'm not on the cloud. So IAS Solutions, though, will allow smaller companies to eliminate the need for their own on-site data center and their co-location data center. Because now you can build all this stuff virtually. And if you do this as platform as a service, then you do a whole lot of things you don't have to worry about. But again, you may want infra um, infrastructure as a service, and there are the solutions for that. So, but the good part is if you go and you're a small company and you're pitching to go get money from a, from a venture fund, they're not going to ask you what your data center solution is. They're going to ask you what your cloud solution is. So make sure that you've got something ready to go here. Now, IAS solutions can support many different companies, right? And there's something called multiple tenancy. And we'll go over that a little bit later on in this course. But you really literally have multiple data centers worldwide from your IAS provider. And you know what? Amazon's got what, like 60, I think. Microsoft's got like 60 or 70. I don't even know how many Google's got, but it's a crazy number of, of things. You can actually geofence things. You can build things in specific locations to solve a large number of different kinds of computing problems. And you can do these across distributed data centers. So if one data center goes down, automatically operations get picked up someplace else. You don't have to move users. Your users can go as long as they have access to the internet. Users can be wherever they're going to be. Most of us are going to have access to the internet through our cell phone networks, or at least disrupted access um, through this. And we can still at least do some kind of business because I'll have people that can access those systems. I'll have employees that are outside the disaster zone. So we can still continue doing the things we need to do. So the cloud as an, inform as an infrastructure as a service solution is really optimal. It really is, because you can get some really good things like load balancing. <laughs> this is the big one. So every country has got rules and regulations about data, where data can be stored, how data can be accessed, who does what when. And load balancing is going to be a big part of this, because sites can experience a wide range of network traffic requirements, spikes, peaks, valleys, and being able to load balance between multiple data centers and including the requirements that we have legally or regulatory wise for storing data, load balancing makes it a whole lot easier for us to do things. So you can actually geofence through load balancing or just load balance period. If all of a sudden you start seeing a big spike in Japan, um, you can actually then start load balancing across whatever you've got in Malaysia and in the United States West Coast. You don't even need to worry about trying to burden your European or your East Coast servers you can handle any kind of spike from Japan coming in that way. And you'll see that someone like Google, Yahoo, Amazon, they're all doing the same thing. To handle millions and millions and millions of web requests, they're basically load balancing to share these requests across multiple servers. They may do something interesting by using what's called a class D IP address, a many to one. So there isn't just one server, that's facebook.com. There's thousands of servers that are facebook.com. So a class D IP address will help you with that process. You have the same um, thing with IPv6, the multicast address. So what they'll do is they'll send it to the first local closest server that responds to that name. And it's a neat way of handling that load balancing as well by just using simple DNS tricks. The weird part about load balancing is that if you're doing IAS, then you still have to worry about this. If you're using your own data center, you still have to worry about this. When you own everything from the virtualization layer on up, you have to provision the servers, you have to provision your load balancing, but the cloud gives you the ability to scale on demand. So you'll have things like Elastic Beanstalk, or you'll have other kinds of templates in both Google and in Azure that will help you pre-stage all this stuff. So you can actually build out your servers as demand increases. You can set these things up depending on how long it takes your infrastructure to build. 
So if it takes an hour for my infrastructure to build and I'm getting a lot of spiky traffic, I may just go ahead and spin one up anyways if I hit 40% on my network bandwidth or on my CPU time, just so that if I've, I'm ready for whatever other spikes are gonna happen along the way. So load balancing and replicated databases. This is probably one of the most brilliant things you can use for your cloud computing, whether it's IaaS or whether it's, it's PaaS, Platform as a Service. The big thing about this is you're going to have a primary database, and you may have a primary database cluster, but there's ways of reducing load through load balancing and replicated databases that will make your systems just sing and work really, really well. You have things like read replicas, so you could literally have one cluster database that takes all of the writes and then replicates that out to a read-only system, so that will alleviate the pressure on your write database so they're not doing so many reads. It's just writing and then shipping data clean on out to the read replicas and then your web users will use that read replica. It's almost instantaneous. If you need to speed up particular segments of that database, you can use something like ElastiCache or Memcache. If you're working in no SQL systems, you can work with things like DAX. So there's a lot of ways of speeding up particular segments of data where this commonly used or commonly asked for, like a product catalog, um, I know that people will use NoSQL to store customer shopping carts. So all you really get in the, in the cookie written to the customer computer is a, is a number. And then that number is stored off in a NoSQL database and maybe stored in DAX. And then all of a sudden you have a good viable shopping cart for that customer for however long you keep that shopping cart. So neat ways of doing load balancing across the way. So that cloud-based data replication can also include network attached storage, not just your cloud based database, but network attached storage. Now, whether you're doing this as a bucket or whether you're doing this as, as a OneDrive or whether you're doing this as a Google Drive or whether you're doing this as a file system that you've actually attached back to your local data center that is a cloud, that is a regular NAS or a full on cloud based NAS or that's block or elastic. There's a lot of solutions here that you can use, and you can replicate a lot of key data within the cloud doing this. And data in the cloud is actually cheap. The hard part is getting it out there. But once it's out there, it's actually cheap to store and process. So Rackspace, and we're going to kind of talk about Rackspace because they do offer a set of solutions that include hosting, managed hosting, and hybrid solutions that combine the cloud and managed services. So you can actually select a solution and deploy from one to 50 servers really quickly. 50 servers doesn't seem like a lot, but it actually is. And you can get larger configurations as available. A few more hoops with Rackspace than you would with Amazon or with Azure or with Google. But it is kind of neat what Rackspace is doing in that process, in that space. So they offer cloud-based solutions to hundreds of thousands of clients, and Rackspace houses its data centers of very large facilities located around the world. There's like maybe about four or 500 data centers in the world that store most of the world's data. With respect to the cloud, Rackspace offers pay-as-you-go scalability, on-demand storage, and load balancing. So beyond that cloud hosting, they're providing solutions for cloud-based email, exchange, file sharing, backups, and collaboration. So it's kind of neat how they do it, but they really do focus in on the IAS version with some software as a service that goes along with it. You can mix and match these environments. You don't just need to be strictly platform or software as a service or infrastructure as a service. You can mix and match. And that's something that not a whole lot of people really realize. So when you're building your architecture out, there is just some things that are just easier to do as a managed service, things like email and databases and things like that. And there are some things you may need for your custom application that may need infrastructure as a service. So you really want to understand what you're building and why you're building it and then you choose the right or build the right infrastructures to support whatever you're doing. So network attached storage is kind of neat. You can actually do um, mounted cloud-based storage devices or you can actually replicate your network attached storage device at your local data center to the cloud. Lots of ways of doing this and it's just mostly going to be replicated data to meet companies' data redundancy needs. The other thing too is we tend to pack rat data, most of us do. So you need to think about a data archive and a data lifecycle process as well if you're going to use cloud-based data storage because if you keep everything ready and good to go, it can be really quite expensive. So you'll want to use something like cold storage or any like Glacier if it's AWS to move data off on to deeper, darker storage depending on what you need to do for the time frame. 
or actually pull it off of the cloud and move it over to Iron Mountain, depending on what you've got. But it's a great way of just making sure that you've got data on demand when you need it and how you need it. So network attached storage is a good thing, and it's something that we use a lot. Uh, Nervanix IAS provides cloud-based NAS, which is accessible through the Cloud NAS file system. So essentially, you're just building a VPN between your company and that cloud-based NAS interface, and then moving data around or moving data over, and people get to it through NFS, FTP, you can get through it through SharePoint, however you want to do it. Cloud NAS for Nervanix works just like any other NAS system that you've got in your environment at work. So advantages of IAS, and this is really interesting, it gets rid of your data center. Now that can be a problem because you probably don't want to get rid of all of your data center. You may have some legacy systems that need to stay in your data center, but it takes the pressure off of growing your data center or allows you to constrict your data center and make it smaller. So there's some ease of hardware scalability, but you really do need to think about too how you want your software to scale along the way. Definitely reduce hardware costs. Again, it's on-demand, pay-as-you-go scalability, so if you need more hardware, if you need something like that, you can just go ahead and get it, provision it, build it. Reduction of IT staff, which is big, but you're still going to see your OpEx costs go. Now remember, you're not buying hardware anymore, so all of your capital expenses, all of your CapEx goes down, which will make management really super happy. But all of your operational expenses will go way up, because pay-as-you-go is generally an OpEx, an operational expense. So that's the trade-off. And a lot of people don't really quite get that trade-off that you're gonna stop paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in capital expenses. And you're gonna start paying hundreds of thousands of dollars per year in operational expenses. The good part, operational expenses, you can, read, you can take off yearly. Um, capital expenses are usually amateurized over a five-year schedule. So there's some benefits there as well, right? Suitability for ad hoc test environments. You can just spin something up, test a theory. And I've done this before in the past. Just test your theory, see if it works, and if it does work, prove it. And you can do it really quick. Allows for complete system administration and management so your server administrators and your database administrators won't be doing anything that they aren't doing already. They just do it in a different place, but they're already going to be using all the same tools and same processes that they use now to access to those systems. Now, there's some server types. You can actually get a, what's called a dedicated virtual server, which is basically a, a dedicated host, right? So physical server, actual hardware is allocated to the customer's dedicated use. That dedicated host, everybody offers that now. Dedicated virtual server is part of that dedicated host along the way. Uh, runs on a physical server that may or may not have other virtual servers. And then the shared virtual server, this is where multi-tenancy comes in. You basically are going to share your hardware with whoever is, is around and that's how it will work. Within the IS environment, customers can allocate various server types. You don't need to be in a uniform heterogeneous environment. You can have things that are on a dedicated Linux server, and you can have things that are on a dedicated Windows server. You just need to be able to work with and understand how these systems interact and interoperate with each other. So all of your security systems can still be on Linux. For what it's worth, you're not going to have a lot of security systems in the cloud. You're going to be mostly relying on the cloud security provided by your provider. But there are things you can do for network forensics and other things along the way. Long story. There's lots of neat things here. But Windows and Linux can, co can coexist in the same environment, just like they would in your regular data center now. So the data center technology that we've seen and that we use, basically when you get to that whole point, that hypervisor is your virtualization layer. The virtual machine interfaces in terms of how that all works really rest on top of your physical services and your physical storage. And then each one of your visual, your virtual servers hosting virtualized IT resources is how this works. So the data center technology, you can be doing this in your own data center. You can virtualize your own data center. VMware is a great way of doing that. Hypervisor, Hyper-V for a Microsoft server is a great way of virtualizing your own data center. So you can extend the lifetime of your data center by just virtualizing it and making your systems more efficient, or you can move to the cloud. So virtualization, you get some good standardization and modularity. You get a lot of automation when you start going ahead and virtualizing your data center, whether it's in the cloud or local. You learn how to do remote operation and management, but they should be doing that already. Remote operation and management is really something we've been doing for a long time now. Um, technically, you'll have high availability. It all depends on how you did your architecture. Not all architectures are going to be high availability depending on how you built it. 
So be aware of that. If you didn't do any disaster recovery, if you didn't do any business continuity, if you didn't make any failover clusters, if you didn't do multi-zone, if you didn't do multi-region, you may not be as high availability as you would like to be. You want to do some security aware design, operation, and management. So this is a big one. Um, most of my background is in security, so I'm going to take this one a little bit more seriously. All right, security aware design, operation, and management. You're going to be leveraging the resources of your Amazon and your Google and your Microsoft security departments along the way. And they will tell you if something is not configured right for their environment. And you need to go fix it when they tell you. They'll actually give you um, in your dashboard um, a, a number listing of 0 to 100, how secure your environment is. So that security aware design, operation, and management because you're in a shared environment with a lot of other people, the security of one person can impact other people along the way. And you want to make sure that when you're doing your infrastructure as a service or platform, that you're not introducing vulnerabilities into their cloud center. And they will tell you about these things. And they will give you a scorecard. And they'll ask you to fix things. And you need to be really prepared to work with their security standards for what you're doing. The facilities you don't need to worry about, computing hardware you don't need to worry about, and storage hardware, all that stuff's taking care of it for you. It's just a neat way of kind of approaching your infrastructure as a service and then being able to just go build out what you need to build out based on what you're comfortable with. So network hardware that you're going to get, you know, basically what they'll take care of are your carrier and external network interconnections. So they will give you a drop point for your VPN which is nice you'll get some load balancing and acceleration depending on how you set things up. LAN fabric, high performance and redundant connectivity, SAN fabric used to connect service to storage devices, and then network attached storage gateways. Those are specific connection points and probably specific software for that. There's uh, little clients you can download for especially for um, FSX, the file system extender for the cloud. It's just kind of neat, but think about this as you kind of go through it that you do get these things from your IAS provider. So some key terms, think about cloud network attached storage, co-location, common internet file system, load balancing, network attached storage, network file system, and redundancy. These are a big part of what we do every day in the cloud for IAS. And then our references, JAMSA and EARL. So thank you very much for sitting through this lecture. I will see you in the next one.